All the people on my grandfather's team weren't just film enthusiasts, they were film mad. But they were also extremely able athletes and mountaineers. It was a meeting of two worlds. But, of course, he had deliberately chosen people who could climb. Even now the pictures are breathtaking. You see athletes on overlong wooden skis racing down impossibly steep slopes across glaciers and jumping over crevasses, dark deep fractures in the ice sheet. And it wasn't just the skis that were very basic. It's hard to imagine the kind of equipment they had back then. In those early days they had cameras operated by turning a crank by hand. They even heaved this equipment weighing dozens of kilos along with huge tripods into the mountains. And once they reached altitudes where even breathing is harder, the team set about producing remarkable shots. Some of the things you see in these old films now, for example the slow motion pictures, make you wonder how did they do that. But there was a slow motion camera available in the early 20s and my grandfather was crazy enough to buy a few of those. The cameras weighed 250 kilograms and they had to pull them on a sledge with ropes into the mountains. And this is how we made the first slow motion sequences of downhill skiers and ski jumpers. They also took the cameras from the tripod and strapped them to their chest or mounted them on a ski to recreate the perspective of an athlete. So they were very, very inventive. At first, the new genre had to fight for attention. So they had to film these scenes 10 or sometimes even 20 times. I'm sure they were often just a hair's breadth away from catastrophe because an avalanche, even one caused by a targeted explosion, is still an avalanche. And all the near misses made for great stories to tell the grandchildren. Of course he told us a lot of stories when we children sat there listening open-mouthed. The one story we love to hear again and again happened during the making of the Mont Blanc film. That's when he himself fell into a crevasse on the Bonson Glacier. Unbelievably, he was not roped up at the time. He was wearing crampons, and as he fell, he instinctively spread his legs to arrest the fall. The spikes caught the ice walls, and he ended up hanging in there, head down. The best bit was when his team let down a rope and somehow managed to get him out, he still had his cigarette holder in his mouth. But even before that, his cameraman, who saw him fall, just said, Oh God, who will finish your film now? For his feature films, Funk worked with some well-known performers and launched the careers of others. For Mont Blanc, he engaged German First World War flying ace Ernst Udet, who is seen precariously steering his plane between rocky peaks before landing it on a snow slope near the top as he joins the dramatic rescue effort. So what was Arnold Funk like with actors? What you hear from people who worked with him, he was a good director, but also extremely demanding. He asked for camera angles to be repeated again and again, simply because the tiny little thing was not quite right, or that it was worth waiting for another half hour so the light would touch the slopes in just the right way. Funk's abilities were not lost on the Nazis when they came to power in Germany in 1933. Their propaganda minister, Josef Goebbels, was fully aware of the power of film. But instead of flourishing, Funk's career took a nosedive. Goebbels visited him in the early days of the Nazi regime and tried to persuade him to join the Nazi party. And my grandfather apparently told him, in a somewhat flippant way, you know, I'm not even a member of a ski club, so why would I join a political party? He did make a few films during the time of the Nazis, but with increasing difficulties. And when he was asked to entirely twist his principles for one final film, he took his name off the credits entirely. Instead, it was his former lead actress in the Mont Blanc film, Leni Riefenstahl, who rose to prominence, making some of the Nazis' most famous propaganda films. After the war, Funk worked as a lumberjack for a while to get by, and it was not until the late 50s that some of his early work was once again shown and recognized. 
Er ist eigentlich heute mehr, mehr oder weniger vergessen. Today he's more or less forgotten. Occasionally one of the many mountain film festivals you'll see all over the world will take one of my grandfather's films into their program, but even that has become quite rare. Sometimes that makes me sad, but on the other hand, when you show these films to young free riders or snowboarders, they are really amazed that the things they do now were done already by people 80 or 90 years ago. So in some way, Fang's legacy lives on, not least in the enduring pull of the mountain that inspired the climber and director in the first place. Ich denke, die, die Leidenschaft für die Berge, die Liebe zu den Bergen, die aus den heutigen Bergfilmen... I think the passion for the mountains that you sense in today's mountain films, then I always get the feeling, wow, they are just as mad today as my grandfather and his people were back then. That was Matthias Funk speaking about his grandfather Arnold to me, Johannes Dell, for Witness History. This is the BBC World Service, where Harriet Gilbert is here to tell us about this month's World Book Club. Yarjas's homegoing begins with two half-sisters who don't know each other. In a series of interconnected stories, we trace the bloodlines of these two women down seven generations and across two continents, taking us from the Gold Coast of Africa to the dive bars of Harlem. World Book Club at bbcworldservice.com slash documentaries. And in half an hour, we're in the studio. The Guggenheim Museum in Bilbao, Spain, like many other cultural institutions, has been hit hard by the COVID pandemic. Hear how the museum team is dealing with the challenges as it sets up a major exhibition of Kandinsky paintings. This is the BBC World Service, the world's radio station. Hello, it is a world first. A fully tested coronavirus vaccine rollout has begun in the UK. We should celebrate the fact that it is good news, but then we do have to add in that note of caution. This is just the beginning and we still need to abide by all the rules that are around us. Also today on the newsroom with me, Nick Miles. Why has one of the main drivers behind automated cars pulled out? He had the right stuff. And he does it. The first human to crack the sound barrier. We look back at the life of the great American test pilot, Chuck Yeager. Later in the program, a group of former rugby players goes to court over the long-term impact of head injuries. And... Hundreds of fans are now congregating. A lot of them are in tears and they're weeping. They're either stunned or they're hysterical. We mark 40 years since the murder of the former Beatle, John Lennon. That's all coming up here on the newsroom. BBC News. Hello, this is Jerry Smith. A 90-year-old British woman has become the first person in the world to be given a fully tested vaccine against COVID-19. Margaret Keenan was given the Pfizer-BioNTech jab as the UK began the biggest vaccination programme the country has ever undertaken. Keith Doyle has this report. This is the moment the world has been waiting for. The first person to be vaccinated with the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine as part of the mass vaccination program. 90-year-old Margaret Keenan received the injection at University Hospital Coventry and Warwickshire this morning. This simple injection marks the start of a mass program aiming to protect the most vulnerable and return life to normal. Margaret, known as Maggie, is 91 next week and said this is the best early birthday present she could wish for. This is for a good cause, so I'm so pleased I had it done. Two doses will be needed, 21 days apart. Protesters in the Armenian capital Yerevan have begun what's intended to be a nationwide campaign of civil disobedience to demand the resignation of the Prime Minister Nikol Pashinyan. The head of the Armenian church is among those who've called for him to step down. Rehan Dimitri reports. The Armenian opposition say Mr. Pashinyan must bear responsibility for the significant territorial losses in and around the Nagorno-Karabakh enclave during the recent war with Azerbaijan. 
But Mr. Pashinyan has repeatedly dismissed calls for his resignation, as well as demands for snap parliamentary elections. Meanwhile, in Azerbaijan, preparations are underway for a victory parade to be held on Thursday. Over the course of the six-week war, which ended a month ago with the Russian brokered truce deal, Azerbaijan regained control over swathes of its territory around Nagorno-Karabakh. The Sri Lankan government has approved a Chinese plan to build a large tyre factory with generous tax concessions. Joe McGivering is our South Asia regional editor. This is the first such deal for the new industrial zone at the Chinese-built port Hambantota. The port is strategically important and China plans to make it a manufacturing hub for exports. The Thai company will employ 2,000 workers and export at least 80% of its goods. Sri Lanka needs foreign investment. Its economy, tourism especially, has been hard hit by militant attacks last year, then the pandemic. But critics accuse the current government of being too willing to make concessions to China. Joel McGivering. The United States has approved the sale of its 11th arms package to Taiwan since President Trump took office. In this latest sale, it's agreed to supply the island with a military communication system. China considers self-governing Taiwan part of its own territory and reacted angrily to the announcement. World News from the BBC. A Senegalese court has sentenced three fathers to a month in prison for paying smugglers to take their sons to Europe. One of the boys died at sea in October. The men also received two years suspended sentences for endangering lives. Our Africa regional editor, Will Ross, reports. The three fathers, who are all fishermen, will spend a month in prison. The court in Mbour, south of the Senegalese capital Dakar, found them guilty of endangering people's lives. One of them, Mamadou Fai, is still grieving for his son. 15-year-old Usman, nicknamed Dudu, was one of many passengers in a wooden boat heading to the Canary Islands in October. But he fell ill at sea and died. His father's crime was paying the $450 fee to the smugglers. Dudu's dream had been to make it onto Italy and to join a football academy. A Turkish ship has been allowed to continue its journey to the western Libyan port city of Misrata after being seized by militias loyal to the warlord Khalifa Haftar. A spokesman for the Benghazi-based forces said the vessel had violated maritime rules and entered a prohibited area, but had been released after inspection and the payment of a fine. The ship is carrying medical equipment from Egypt. Farmers led a four-hour protest strike across India today, blocking roads and railways and disrupting access in and out to the capital, Delhi. They want to put pressure on the government to repeal controversial agricultural reforms after initial talks failed to produce a compromise. Nepal and China have made a joint announcement that Everest, the world's highest mountain, is officially 86 centimetres taller than previously calculated by Nepal. They've determined the exact height at 8,848.86 metres. Previously, China's official figure was four metres lower than Nepal's. BBC News. Hello, this is the BBC. Welcome once more to the newsroom with me, Nick Mars. Just hours ago, history was made when the first person received a fully tested coronavirus vaccine as part of a mass immunisation programme. I wasn't nervous at all. It was really good. I would say go for it. Go for it because it's, it's free and it's the best thing that's ever happened. If I can do it, well, so can you. That is 90-year-old Margaret Keenan from the UK. Dressed in a penguin-themed Christmas T-shirt and surrounded by the world's press, as she got the Pfizer-BioNTech jab. She seemed pretty unfazed by all the attention. She said the vaccine was the best early birthday present she could wish for. She turns 91 next week. Britain is the first country to roll out a fully tested jab program. Uh, I'm joined now by Charlotte Gallagher, our reporter. Charlotte, how significant a moment is this? I don't think we can overstate how important this day is, Nick. I mean, let's be honest. This year, for a lot of people, has been a real struggle. It's been completely miserable for some, hasn't it? But finally, we seem to have light at the end of the tunnel, especially for people like Margaret. You said she's 90. She told reporters she's had to be 
basically isolate in her home on her own for most of the year. She hasn't been able to see her family. She's not been able to hug her children, her grandchildren. This jab essentially is giving her a new lease of life and just in time for her birthday and Christmas. And let's hear from the first person to receive the jab in Northern Ireland. That's the 28-year-old nurse, Joanna Sloan. I felt proud and emotional. We've worked very hard um, to get to this point and um, the health service in general um, has struggled throughout the fight um, for COVID-19, so it feels like an, a momentous day. Charla, it's worth remembering, though, that there's still a long way to go with this rollout, isn't there? There is indeed. So at the moment, Britain has the first batch of this vaccine they ordered, and that's enough for around 200,000 people. They're hoping to have enough to vaccinate 2 million people by the end of the year and 20 million doses in total. There's obviously other vaccines that are being developed in the UK that are hoping to be in circulation soon. So let's be honest, for me and you, we won't get the vaccine for months, probably not until the middle of next year year. The priority now is the over 80s, people with certain health conditions, frontline health workers like the nurse we just heard, and also people working in care homes. They will be the first priority. Coronavirus isn't going away. It's still going to be out there. And we're being warned not to be complacent. Now, Professor Sean Griffiths is urging people not to relax too much and not to forget social distancing. Congratulations to everyone involved, to the uh, scientists, to the health services. You know, we should celebrate uh, the fact that it is good news. Uh, but then we do have to add in that note of caution. Um, you know, it's, this is just the beginning and we still need to abide by all the rules that are around us because the disease is with us. At the moment, only hospitals can administer this particular vaccination because it has to be stored at minus 70. And even a lot of hospitals don't have freezers that can get that low. Hospitals that are giving out vaccinations, they're saying that they're worried about anti-vaxxers turning up, some staff even receiving abusive phone calls. Some people sceptical about the vaccine, despite officials saying it's been tested thoroughly and it's gone through extensive clinical trials. Something to make you smile. The second person who received the vaccine in England was named none other than William Shakespeare. Of course it was. Um, well, that's the situation here in the UK. What about around the world and their vaccination programmes? Russia, they developed a vaccine called Sputnik V and they have begun rolling it out. However, and it's kind of a big but really, it's not, been, it's not gone through clinical trials yet. It's still being trialled to make sure that it's safe and it works. So a lot of Russians are very sceptical about it. Obviously, Vladimir Putin, he's pretty confident because one of his daughters has received the vaccination. Some countries have already ordered it, including Hungary, Venezuela, Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan. In China, they're in the final stages of testing two vaccines, which should be out soon. The US, we know, has been hit really hard by coronavirus. Officials are meeting this week and they're hoping to kind of rubber stamp a vaccine rollout, which will be a huge huge relief for people living there. The big question is developing countries. We've talked a lot about these rich countries. How will developing countries get access to this vaccine as it's so expensive? And there could need to be some kind of fundraising campaign, governments giving money to other countries to ensure people living in developing nations don't miss out. Yeah, I know a lot of countries in, across Africa aren't expecting to get this um, before 2022. Charlotte, many thanks for that. There have been plenty of false dawns in the promised bright new era of driverless cars. Technical, regulatory and safety issues have all got to be overcome. It's time consuming and very expensive. Uh, so what are we to make of the news that the taxi firm Uber has now agreed to sell its autonomous driving business to Aurora? That's a specialist company set up by leading Silicon Valley executives. So I asked our business correspondent Theo Leggett why Uber's selling up. If you think back a few years ago, Uber set out plans to develop its own self-driving cars. The idea was that you would have autonomous taxis so you could get rid of all the costs and trouble associated with having drivers and at least within city centres have autonomous taxis. But the programme has been a difficult one. To begin with, it's been very expensive. It's used up a lot of cash at a time when Uber's struggling for profitability. There have also been problems. So, for example, two years ago, there was a very widely reported accident where one of Uber's test vehicles ran down a lady in Arizona when it was operating in autonomous mode, albeit with a safety driver at the wheel, and she very sadly died. And there have been rows as well over poaching of staff and copyright material, things like that. So 
So this has been a problematic programme for Uber. So now it wants to focus on its core business, so that's ride hailing, it's the Uber Eats food delivery business, that kind of thing, and leave development of autonomous vehicles to a company that has been deliberately set up for the purpose, which is Aurora. So Aurora, a specialist company, so I imagine it doesn't necessarily bode badly for the future of driverless vehicles. Not at all. This is a well-funded business with a lot of Silicon Valley's expertise all in one place. Uber will have a significant stake in that company and in the fullness of time when the technology is ready we'll be able to draw on that technology. Do you reckon we're still very much at the early stages of a real exponential growth in driverless cars? A lot of people were expecting it to happen quicker. Well, it depends what you mean by driverless cars. There are different forms of autonomy. So one form of autonomy, for example, is cars effectively driving themselves on a highway. You've seen things that move in that direction already. Um, lane keeping software, where a car, a car can stay in its lane on a highway, even pull out to overtake. That kind of thing is not so difficult. Having cars which can drive themselves along a highway and then into a city and then find a particular address is more complicated. The nearest thing to that that we've seen is so-called geofenced uh, autonomous cars where they will operate on a grid pattern in a limited area within a city. Um, but when you get cars going pretty much wherever they want by themselves, all sorts of variables come into play and that's much, much harder to do. Theo Leggett there. Everest is famously the world's highest mountain, but China and Nepal, the two countries whose border it straddles, couldn't agree exactly how high. Well, now they've issued a joint statement, as I heard from our environment correspondent, Navin Singh Kadka. They came up with this figure, which is 8,848.86 meters, meaning almost a meter higher than what it was before. So now what they say is, this is the snow cap height which means that now they will not dispute whether Everest should be measured with its rock height or snow height. So this is now decided for once and for all that this is the height of the highest mountain in the world. So one one ten thousandth higher, it doesn't seem like an awful lot. Why, why did these two countries need to come out with this joint statement, do you think? China, as you know, has measured the mountains at least twice in the past. Nepal had not done so on its own. Nepal had relied on the 1954 Survey of India figure. And uh, to be honest, we reported this in 2012 that Nepal was under pressure from China to change that figure to what China was saying. Back then it was 8,844.43, the rock height, so to say. And Nepal said, no, we can't do that. And therefore, they, they started measuring uh, the height. So when Nepal started measuring, China then said, OK, in that case, we also would do it. And in the meantime, if you remember, in 2015, there was a major earthquake. And so... Geographers and scientists, uh, you know, they suspected that there might be some change. Now, we don't know if it was earthquake or it was something else. It was the tectonic plates. But here we are, the two joint hands, and they decided to make a joint announcement, which they did. That was high-level diplomacy from Navin Sinkadka. You are listening to the newsroom from the BBC World Service. Here's Jerry with a reminder of our main headlines. Britain has become the first country to begin a mass coronavirus vaccination program with an authorised fully tested jab. The taxi firm Uber is ending its effort to develop its own self-driving vehicles. And as we've just been hearing, China and Nepal have agreed on a new height for Mount Everest and it's 86 centimetres taller than previously thought. Thanks, Jerry. Rugby is the definition of a contact sport. Great efforts have been made to protect players in recent years, but a group of more than 70 former players, including international stars, are now preparing a class action seeking compensation for the long-term impact of concussion injuries. I got more details from our sports news correspondent, Alex Capstick. Well, this could turn into a massive story with huge ramifications for the unions around the world which run rugby. As you say, around uh, 70 former players, some of them high-profile former internationals, have instructed a legal firm to sue 
the governing bodies for long-term brain injury. Uh, damage which uh, it claimed they suffered as a direct result of not being protected uh, by the game's authorities during the years that they played the sport. It's reported in New Zealand that Carl Heyman, a, a former all-black prop forward, is one of those involved in the legal action. He was quoted as saying he thought it would be something quite substantial. Uh, I mean, we've known about these long-term injuries before. Stories of players who received regular knocks to the head in what is a, a physical, some would say brutal sport, but it was never treated. They were allowed to stay on the pitch despite suffering from concussion. And that has led to a number of physical and psychological health issues among former players. And Alex, there is a legal precedence for this. Uh, there was a similar legal action taken in America. Yeah, it, it's very similar to the class action taken by um, NFL, uh, former NFL players. Uh, uh, they got uh, four and a half thousand players in total um, and that was after a link was found between repetitive knocks to the head and a condition called CTE, that's chronic traumatic encephalopathy, a degenerative disease that leads to forgetfulness, mood swings, depression, in some cases people taking their own lives. And that was discovered after experts in Boston examined the brains of former players and the payout is expected to reach around a billion dollars. The claim here is very similar in that the players argue that governing bodies knew about the dangers in rugby uh, associated with concussion but didn't do enough about it. And that was Alex Capstick. Forty years ago today, the former Beatle, John Lennon, was killed in New York in an act of violence that shocked millions of his fans. Lennon was shot by a disturbed fan as he returned to his home, the Dakota apartment building, with his wife, Yoko Ono. Reporting live from the Dakota for BBC News at the time was Tom Brook. Forty years on, Tom, who still lives in New York, has been taking a very personal look back at his memories of that night and exploring Lennon's growing legacy today. John Lennon's anthem, Imagine, is routinely performed by musicians and fans in Strawberry Fields, that section of New York's Central Park dedicated to the former Beatles' memory, just across the street from the Dakota apartment building. Millions of Americans first heard the news while watching Monday Night Football on the ABC network. An unspeakable tragedy. John Lennon, outside of his apartment building on the west side of New York City, shot twice in the back, dead on arrival. In London, the BBC's Today programme was on the air, bringing first news of Lennon's death to British audiences. I had rushed to the Dakota, found a public phone booth on West 72nd Street. Everyone around me, Lennon fans, were crying. Soon I was on the air. John Lennon was killed two hours ago. Um, I, I've got most of my information from talking to the literally hundreds of fans who are now congregating outside the Dakota building where they're going to hold an all-night vigil. And it's a very weird scene indeed because they're playing Lennon music. A lot of them are in tears and they're weeping and they're either stunned or they're hysterical. Over the years, I've watched as journalist colleagues have covered the deaths of other pop culture figures, but none seem to bring forth the collective grief witnessed with John Lennon. Celebrated New York photographer Bob Gruen was one of Lennon's friends. It was such a shock, you know, that he died and that he died so violently when all his life he had been talking about peace and trying to help others imagine peace. And here he was shot for that. You but 40 years on, the trauma has receded, and John Lennon now has a new generation of fans, some very young. Among them, 10-year-old Yasha Kegelis, who I met in Strawberry Fields. I like the words, and I like the music, and, yeah. and I, I like the rhythm and how it all goes together. Another young fan, Robbie Ross, sees John Lennon as a very relevant musician for all of us in 2020. He's got a real reputation for being a man of peace and spirituality, which I think speaks to the moment today in a pretty fundamental way. I mean, the song Imagine is sort of a banner song of what we're all trying to work toward right now. That report on the lasting legacy of John Lennon was by Tom Brook. And now Jerry is here with some of the other stories we've been looking at today. Florida police have raided the home of the data scientist Rebecca Jones, who built the state's official COVID-19 database. Ms Jones was fired from her job at the Department of Health in May after accusing it of manipulating virus data in order to relax pandemic restrictions. She posted a series of videos on the raid on Twitter in which armed officers seized her phone and laptop. The force said he was responding to a hack of the state's emergency health alert system, which Ms Jones denies. 
German prosecutors say they remain convinced that a child sex offender known as Christian B kidnapped and killed Madeleine McCann and that they're continuing to build a case against him. Madeleine was three when she disappeared from a holiday apartment in the Portuguese resort of Praia de Luz in 2007. Our Berlin correspondent Jenny Hill has more. The German, who's in his 40s, is currently in jail for drug smuggling and the rape of a tourist in the same resort from which Madeleine McCann went missing. One of the prosecutors in the case said that a six-month investigation had yielded fresh evidence of at least three other alleged sex crimes in Portugal, two of them against children. It was possible, he added, that Christian B would be charged over those offences early next year. And staff at Barcelona Zoo in Spain say five lions have tested positive for COVID-19. It's only the second known case in which large felines have been infected. Three females and one male were tested after keepers noticed they showed symptoms. Veterinary experts in Barcelona are investigating how the lions, which were isolated from other animals, became infected. They've contacted colleagues at the Bronx Zoo in New York, where four tigers and three lions tested positive for the coronavirus in April. Thanks, Jerry. Uh, let's return to our main story now, the drive to halt the spread of COVID-19 in humans. Uh, 2020 has been a total nightmare of a year for the world, but thanks to science, 2021 promises to be a lot better. But with the arrival of a, a number of vaccines, as we've been reporting, comes a host of hard questions, which the BBC's Naomi Grimley has been considering. Welcome aboard. At Qantas, we're very proud of our safety record. The head of the Australian airline Qantas surprised some when he said you might be required to have a COVID vaccine before you travelled on one of his planes. But this is almost certainly the future that awaits us. When the vaccine is rolled out, I think that there's going to be a huge effort to nudge people into having the vaccine and things where you can integrate it into everyday life, like flying, uh, a way of doing that. Dr Sharifa Sekalala is from the School of Law at Warwick University and specialises in global health law. She points out you already need vaccination certificates for some infectious diseases like yellow fever. Airlines actually enforce that because if you get to your destination and the border agents refuse to let you in, then the airline is responsible for flying you back. And so that's been happening within some contexts, but I actually think that it's going to become much wider and much more pronounced. So as vaccines come online, it's inevitable that not just airlines, but travel insurance companies and even states will insist on seeing evidence of your immunised status. But that's not without its problems. Thomas Boyke is director of the Global Health Programme at the Council on Foreign Relations. He worries about disparities between rich and poor nations once the best vaccines are approved. It is only a handful of countries that have secured advanced doses of those vaccines. There will be a very limited supplies for other nations. So adding to their resentment about having to wait while other wealthy nations vaccinate potentially their entire populations, people will also be unable to benefit from being able to rejoin commerce and travel if these kinds of vaccine requirements are imposed on entry of travelers into those nations. He's worried too about tensions within nations if some try to jump the vaccination queue. There was a single day where the public health authority in Oklahoma had used roughly 60% of its available testing capacity to test a visiting NBA team instead of its broader citizens. We may see that happen on vaccines. It's not supposed to. These are supposed to be allocated to frontline health workers and individuals who might benefit from the most. But there is a real risk that we will see celebrities and the wealthy get them first. And that report was by Naomi Grimley. And we're going to end this edition of the newsroom with the, the sad news that Chuck Yeager, the legendary US pilot has died at the age of 97. He was the first man to break the sound barrier and lived a remarkable life. Henry Bellow has this report.